Aha. Alright, we gotta try that one again. Aloha! Good afternoon. I'm Major Brandon Palmer from the J6 Directorate at US Indo Pacific Command, and it is my pleasure to be your MC for this lunch event on the last day of the 36th annual AFSIA Asia Pacific TechNet. As, at its, as a courtesy to our guest speaker and to our fellow professionals, we request that you silence any communication device. The questions for today's speaker may be texted to the email address that will be provided on the screens to the side. We'd like to recognize Fabian Plath and Taito Athene, a couple of many supporting partners for their role in making this event happen. We're also joined this afternoon by tomorrow's leaders and their cadre, who are now part of the junior and senior ROTC programs from across the great state of Hawaii. As you are called, go ahead. As I call the uh, different campuses out, uh, would you please stand and be recognized? From the University of Hawaii Manoa campus, the Army, Air Force, and Navy ROTC cadets. In the high school program, we have Kailua High School. Kahuku High School. Moana Loa High School. <laughs> Lelehua High School. <laughs> St. Louis High School. <laughs> and from the island of Kauai, uh, Waimea. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're now on break, so you may enjoy your lunch meal. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Major General Gerard, the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Aloha. Aloha. All right. Good afternoon. All right, I think everybody's uh, just finished eating, so at least you'll stay awake for a few more minutes, uh, maybe, uh, so while I talk. But I, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here. I, I, I sincerely appreciate um, Linda and on her team and all that they've done to, to continue to, to make this such a great event. I just heard this is the biggest one ever. I don't know if that's because uh, we're getting better or because everybody's just tired of COVID and everybody wanted to come to Hawaii. We're, we're good either way. Uh, just keep it, keep improving, keep, keep making it better. I, I do know uh, that, that, you know, that y'all would have probably appreciated having Admiral Aquilino and Lieutenant General Sklinka and here, but it was an incredibly busy week at Indopaycom, so you're stuck with me. So I apologize, but, uh, but hopefully I can be a little bit entertaining. You know, I, I did have a couple of, uh, colorful stories, uh, war stories to throw out there, but um, I realize there's some folks in the audience that know me and there's nothing that ruins a good war story like an eyewitness. Um, and so I, I'll, I'll save those, but, um, but I am very, very happy to be here and, and hopefully um, I can convey Indo-PACOM's priorities. I hope those have been threaded in the other comments of the component commanders that spoke to you or deputy commanders that spoke to you here throughout the week. I, I've gotten feedback recently that, that one thing Admiral Aquilino has achieved is everybody in Indo-PACOM is on message. 
and we are consistent and congruent in our, our articulation of the capabilities that we need uh, to accomplish our mission. Um, this year's theme, From Data to Dominance. Um, and I hope throughout the week we have identified some ways that we can use data better to achieve dominance um, because that's where we are in our current operational environment. Data is extremely important. Why, why is dominance so important to Indopaycom? And why is data a piece of that solution? You know, one of the, I was fortunate enough to, several years ago to work for General Funk, uh, the current TRADOC commander over in Iraq and Syria, and he's got a list of General Funk-isms, sayings. One of them is, if you can communicate, if we can communicate, we can win. And the corollary is absolutely true as well. If we can't communicate, we're probably not going to win. And so data is part of communication. And that's why it's important. If we, if we cannot communicate, if we can't manage data and use it well, we are going to have a hard time winning. And we and our allies and partners are all about winning. Winning matters. You know, I'm a joint officer, but I'll still throw in a, a chief of staff of the Army uh, quote there. Ar winning matters, absolutely. Um, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a bunch of high-end uh, strategic and operational capabilities that we need. But I, I do want to bring it back a little bit to why is it important? Because it's absolutely important to win, and it's so that means it's important at the strategic and operational levels. But when I was a young captain up at the 25th Infantry Division, um, Bravo Company 227 Wolfhounds, awesome, Wolfhounds, no fear. Um, we went to JRTC, and we went to JRTC in February. Why we went from Hawaii, why we got the February rotation, I'll never know. But we were actually delayed a day going into the box because they had so much snow on the tents uh, at Fort Polk that they were worried they were going to collapse, so they delayed us a day going there. That's how cold it was. It was, it was chilly. Um, but we, were the, we did our first phase, and we shifted, and we're, we're executing a defense, and we, um, we put out some security positions way out front. And they were in the exactly right position. Um, we didn't know that at the time, but we thought it was a good place to put them, but we weren't sure, but it was exactly the right position. And then uh, we were given priorities of work to my executive officer in the company, and, and one of the things, his task, one of, I think the top one or two, it may have been the number one, was, hey, make sure those guys got to resupply batteries. And then went down the rest of them. Well, the night wore on, uh, it gets, in, gets intense, the Army, uh, the bad guys start probing us, and then they start running right down beside that, uh, our security position, probably about three or four kilometers to our front, but never heard any reporting. And we, so we didn't really know where they were until they were all over us. And uh, you know, the, the, the op opposing force, the op four at JRTC is very good. They're very good today. They've always been good. It's because they get to practice every, what they really do every day of the week. And so they, they ran all over us. And only in the, the after action report did we figure out that um, my XO never got batteries to that security position. So about 11 o'clock, 2300 at night, they lost power. And so they were in the right place. They had the right radios to communicate, but we didn't, didn't have batteries. And so they could not communicate to us and tell us what the bad guys were doing. So we could deploy artillery, mortars, whatever, to, to stop them. And I, and I give you that story just as a reminder that no matter what we're talking about, it's real to that 18, 19-year-old soldier who, sailor, airman, marine, that is at the tip of the spear that we're putting into harm's way. And if we don't have, do everything we can to make sure they have all the capabilities they need to fight and win, then we are not doing them justice. And so we're going to talk about a bunch of other stuff, but at the end of the day, it's about making sure that we can accomplish our mission to perfection. And, and folks argue with me, is perfection a, a truly obtainable, obtainable goal? But I guarantee you to every mother and father that allows their, or sometimes don't, doesn't have a voice in it, but, uh, but every young person that serves in our nation's military, their parents, their wives, their children, absolutely want them to have the very, very best material so that we can accomplish our mission and bring everybody back home. So it's real. What we're doing today and what we're talking about is, is serious stuff and it's real. So hopefully that 
that puts it into perspective. Why is data and why is dominance important to Indopaycom? We are responsible for the most consequential theater with the most, co most comprehensive, urgent, and enduring challenges to the vital U.S. national security interest. Those aren't my words. Those are words from the, the Secretary of Defense, other senior leaders in the Department of Defense, and the senior military members in the Department of Defense. We are also facing the most dominant threat, the People's Republic of China, the PRC's coercive and increasingly aggressive efforts to subvert the international system to suit its author author <laughs> authoritarian um, preferences threatens peace, stability, and the rules-based international order that has benefited all nations for more than 80 years. Most consequential theater with the most consequential adversary. So what's our role in this problem? To confront these challenges within the region, U.S. Indo-PACOM employs an integrated joint force to accomplish key priorities as identified by the Secretary of Defense, which include defense of the homeland, deterring conflict, and strengthening our allies and partners. These priorities advance through integrated deterrence, and that's Secretary Austin's um, Definition is that integrated deterrence is, is our approach to, to preventing conflict through the synchronization of all elements of national power. The Department of Defense recognizes we can't do this by ourselves. Along with um, the joint force that is executing in all domains together with our allies and partners. I would like to amplify that last point just a little bit, together with our allies and partners. When I was on the Joint Staff several years ago, the chairman at the time was General Dunford, and he, he had a couple of, of thoughts. One of them was that we, um, we will never go to war again without our allies and partners. And I, I think he was absolutely right, um, because if we do go without our allies and partners, we're not going to be in a good place. Um, I mean, you can look at Russia. Uh, you know, Russia wishes they had more allies and partners right now. Um, so we will never go to war without our allies and partners. Another th thing he talked about was and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more with sharing information. He said, you know, we, we created the Five Eyes construct, and that was an excellent construct 60 years ago. Is it the right construct now? Um, and, you know, whether you can argue whether it is or isn't, uh, it's a great construct, uh, some great key allies and partners, but, but as I'll talk about in a few minutes, that's not the solution going forward. We're going to have to share information and share it liberally with everybody that wants to be our partner, not just our Five Eye partners. Um, and what, that is one of our key asymmetric advantages is our security challengers do not possess our network of strong alliance and partnerships because th th these relationships are based on shared values and people-to-people -people ties, and they provide significant advantages such as long-term mutual trust, understanding, respect, interoperability, and a common commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific. Admiral Aquilino has asked our staff and our components to seize the initiative. Seize the initiative describes Indo-PACOM's approach to executing integrated deterrence and requires the joint force to think, act, and operate differently by synchronizing our operations, realigning our posture, and advancing our warfighting capabilities. So what warfighting capabilities do we need? We need the ability to protect the joint force, to operate in contested space, to improve all domain battle space awareness, to employ integrated fires, to support forward forces with sustainable theater-based logistics, to facilitate high-end joint training in theater, to establish a more forward, more distributed posture and advance ally and partner interoperability and strengthen their security capabilities. All of these are laid out in the recent report that Admiral Aquilino delivered to Congress at their request. Let me highlight the top three warfighting capability gaps operating in contested space. We require joint force capabilities supported by electronic warfare, space, cyber, and over the horizon radars to counter adversary efforts to deny our freedom of maneuver across all domains. 
We also need all domain battle space awareness combined with joint, a joint fires network to provide the joint force with a comprehensive sensing, tracking, and distribution of all actions and activities in the ground, air, maritime, cyber, and space domains. I don't know why, um, you know, as I look at that, I think we, we left out one piece in there, but it's also the information domain. Um, and I'm not sure why we did, um, but I'm looking at Vic over there as I say that. We need a near-term capability to remove the latency of target quality data generated by sensors throughout the region to generate integrated fire control solutions to deliver effects across multiple dom domains, land, air, sea, cyber, and space. And finally, to employ integrated fires, we need ground-based air and naval long-range weapons to provide combat formations with the precision strike capabilities that are, that are operational operationally decentralized and geographically dist distributed in theater. So those, those are the key capabilities that Admiral Aquilino has told everybody, and, and if you ask him what his top three are, he'll, he'll throw those at you in a heartbeat. There are two other prior priorities. There's actually three. I'm going to save the last one for later, but two other priorities that will enable the joint force and our combined forces to, to provide integrated deterrence and they include protecting the joint force. We are building a 360 degree persistent air and missile defense system on Guam that also provides improved battle space awareness, protecting the homeland. To prepare the joint and combined force, uh, the US and all of our allies and partners, we must train as we fight. To facilitate high-end joint training, we are developing the Pacific multi-domain test and experimentation capability, PIMTEC. Um, and, and Dr. Wood back there is, is our point man to deliver that capability. And I've, you know, I, I have to write it out whenever I say it because I, I know PIMTECH, I know what it is, but I never can remember the acronym. Um, so I'm glad I had it spelled out here. But this is a modernized distributed training capability that will enhance warfighting readiness to compete against peer level adversaries at speed, scope, scale, and operational distances, both in the near term and in the future. PIMTECH's in-state is a joint combined and coalition warfighting, warfighter enabled capability to realistically rehearse fighting in highly contested all domain environments against peer adversary capabilities to deliver integrated deterrence. Admiral Aquilino continues to harp on training as we fight and everything we do every day should be a rehearsal. So what do all of these capabilities have in common? Quick quick look back, ability to protect the force, operate in contested space, improve all domain battle space awareness, employ integrated fires, support forward forces, facilitate high end, establish a more forward, more distributed posture, and advance ally and partner interoperability. What do all of them have in common? The need for data, for data. Developing the ability to move data seamlessly across domains at different classification levels with our allies and partners will help us achieve dominance. Will help us achieve dominance. So I'm, just, I'm sure Denise has, has provided this group an, an overview of what we're doing to deliver these capabilities, but I'll hit some of the highlights. You know, our, our biggest, well, first, we're standing up a, a data office. Um, the, some of, at least SOCOM, I, I know, had another, a data office. I think some of the others had one, um, but we're just now standing it up. And we appreciate all the support from the Office of Secretary of Defense, who uh, has, has a data office now combined with the data and AI office, I think that's the right term there, um, who provided us some, some data scientists who've been in our command here for a year or so and have been working this problem set all under Denise, but we, now we're pulling that out and, and making a a, our own data office. Um, you know, the second thing we, well, I say we, the second thing I did was uh, bought data for dummies. True story, true story, sitting on my desk at work right now. Denise, Denise recommended it, but I did. And, uh, and then we, we're hiring a, our chief data officer. Uh, and we, we're right in the middle of, we, we've identified the individual, and so we're just in the process of bringing him on board. Um, but both he, and I told him this, both, I told him what I did, and so both he and Denise are now they're having trouble sleeping at night because they're, they're worried I'm going to have expertise dominance on them uh, with my Data for Dummies book. Um, but it is, it is absolutely important. And the, the real thing that we're doing, though, and I know Denise has talked a little bit, 
because um, whether it's the system, the Guam defense system, whether it's PEMTEC, whether it's all the other capabilities we are developing, we got to have something that, that ties them together, that shared, that moves that data back and forth. And, and so that's our um, mission partner environment that we're working on. Um, and a key par part of that is the mission data platform. And, and I could go a little bit deeper, but I'd probably get it wrong, and I know Denise has talked about it, but, but that is our efforts. And, I, and thanks to N Denise and her team, they are moving that ball very quickly forward. You know, when I was on the joint staff working for General Dunford and his frustration at how we were sharing information, um, he, he finally said, hey, we're gonna, we gotta figure out who's in charge of this effort because all the services were kind of doing their own thing. And so we, we identified the mission partner capability, capability office, MPCO, and we gave it to the, and it's under the Air Force, and I'm not disparaging the Air Force. This is a hard problem to solve, but we still haven't necessarily solved it even this many years after General Dunford directed that. And so we've been moving out on our own trying to solve it. Some of the other combatant commands are doing the same. But I think um, we are uh, as far, as far or maybe further ahead than others based on some of the latest advances that, that Denise and her team have, have fielded and provided. Just as, as recently as February when we're exercising with our Japanese partners and Keen Edge and using mission partner, the mission data platform to, to share information real time and, and even chat with our partners in English. They see it in Japanese, respond in Japanese, and now push it back to us and we see it in English. And I, you know, there, there are other technolo technological advances out there um, we've, we've got to harness all that and bring them to the warfighter. It's 2022, and I see different things happening, and I know that there are things out there that we could be doing much better with data, with information, communication, some of our other technologies, and we just got to harness those, and, and these type conferences allow us to do that. And so again, my, my thanks to FCA and, and all their efforts to bring these together. Uh, and hopefully we have moved the ball forward this week with some of our discussions, or if we hadn't, at least we've made the right connections this week so that we can start collaborating and, and iterating and delivering on some of the capabilities that, that we've identified we need to be successful out here in Indo-PACOM. So thanks again for letting, giving me the opportunity to, to speak a little bit. Everybody that's here that, that, uh, that flew in from off island needs to thank FCA for just for the fact of doing this here so you could come to Hawaii. In, in April. Um, but thank you all very much. And with that, I'll pause and, and take some questions. Sir, thank you. Um, first question, what is one life lesson that you can pass to the JROTC and AFSIA emerging leaders in the room today? Wow. All right. If you you know, that's, a, that's dangerous. If you get, get me to talking about leadership, uh, I could be here for all afternoon because uh, I'm passionate about leadership. I think leadership is a weapon system, and we got to hone it every day. The, I, I'm actually, I appreciate that, that question because I wrote it down on the top of my notes. I didn't realize we were going to have ROTC students here, and I wrote it down, but I skipped right over it when I got up here. So my first comment to all of the ROTC uh, students in the room is that um, you can be standing where I am in a matter of years. You know, when I was your age, when I was a ROTC cadet at North Georgia College, there, not in the furthest imaginations of my mind did I ever think that I would be a general officer. Even when I was a company commander at 25th Infantry Division, my, my partner, one of my good friends right across the quad in 127 was Ron Clark. And after company command, I went to Ranger Regiment and hung out at Ranger Regiment. Um, Ron Clark went to be the, the commanding general's aide. Everybody said, Ron Clark, that's, he's a future general officer. Nobody said that about J.B. Girard. <laughs> and, uh, so, so my first message to you is uh, you can do anything you want to do, and uh, you can absolutely be a general officer if you stick around. Um, my, my second uh, thing, and there's a whole host of them, um, well, I'll give you two real quick. Um, you know, when the senior leaders in the Army, when the chief of staff of the Army came and visited me up at Schofield when I was the 25th Infantry Division commander, a lot of problems throughout the Army, a lot of things he could have talked on, readiness, um, 
fielding the latest capabilities, some of the other problems. But his message to me and to all the leaders in the division were, hey, build cohesive teams. Build cohesive teams. So understand what, it, what is required of leaders to build cohesive teams. You can't have a cohesive team unless you got trust, and you can't have trust unless you are, every single person in the organization treats each other with dignity and respect. And so treat each other with dignity and respect, develop trust vertically, horizontally throughout the organization, and you'll have a great, a great team, kind of like the Georgia Bulldogs this year. <laughs> Go dogs! And then uh, the last thing I'd say is, hey, learn. Nobody learns more than I do every single day, whether it's Denise and her team coming in and, and telling me what I don't know about data and other things. Um, but I love reading. I can't, I don't read, uh, I don't have time. I still have, I got six kids, I got four of them still at home, so I have no time between work and my kids to read. Uh, but what I do uh, is I listen to books you know, when I work out every day. I got my stress release, I gotta, gotta exercise. And so I listen to books. Currently listening to uh, the latest book on change, um, Leading Change, the guy wrote Leading Change several years ago, but uh, now he's updated this version. I'm reading it this morning, and the latest science talks about, you know, uh, survival mode, and that's when you're just stressed and you're, you're you know, you got a, a very hard-charging boss, probably not a great work environment, and so you're just trying to survive every day. Crushes, crushes innovation, because everybody's just trying to get, get stuff done and, and keep, maintain status quo. Nobody likes to change. Then you, then you got those great leaders out there who are creating an environment where everybody is thriving and innovation is flowing. Every, everybody can, can exercise discipline initiative at all levels of the organization. Everybody's thriving and innovation goes through the roof. And we got to have problem solvers at every single level of organizations if we're going to be great. So those are my comments. Don't ask any more on leadership or I'll, I'll keep talking all afternoon. All good. What's the next question? With the multiple service networks that we are living with, that we are living now with, how can we assure that we will have joint and coalition connectivity when China attempts to disrupt them, and can we effectively defend against China's effort? So, uh, how can we, and then can we? Yes, we can. Um, and how can we? Mission partner environment. Is that a good answer, to these? <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, but, but we, we absolutely can, and you know, I, I'm, I'm just learning. I am learning about that, I'm learning. But I know, I, I mean, I, I don't know definitively, I can't give you chapter and verse, but I know there are civilian commercial entities out there who deal in billion dollar transactions that encrypt their data ruthlessly to prevent anybody from gaining access to that data. And if commercial entities can do it, we can do it. And so we, we've just got to harness that technology. We've, you know, Denise and team gave me a great brief on mission partner environment the other week uh, and our zero trust mentality for every piece of data in there. And it's much easier, you know, again, they convinced me, again, you could ask me a few questions and, and get way, way above my level of expertise, but it absolutely makes sense because of the first point I made that it is much, <clears throat> It makes more sense to encrypt or to secure the data than it does the network. Everybody's going to get to your network one way or the other. It's happening every single day around the world. Um, however, if you can encrypt the data, that's much more difficult. And you continuously assess that data and make sure that when something is going wrong, you can identify it and solve that problem. So I think that is my best answer, and, and I'll defer to the experts any further than that. Thank you. Is the Indo-PACOM HQ successfully driving requirements and a sense of urgency to the acquisition community to accelerate the fielding and sustainment of the most robust, adaptable, scalable, secure, and resilient coalition mission partner network? So I think we are. Um, I would like to say yes, but I think that the folks in this room are probably a, a better judge of that than I am. Um, I do think that we have achieved some success. You know, Admiral Aquilino will tell you that he, um, he has delivered a report to Congress and the FY23 budget is delivering the resources required to execute his plan. But it's, that plan has not necessarily changed from 
Admiral Davidson or Admiral Harris or other commanders before him. Um, but he has stayed on message and has communicated very clearly. And, and I think Denise and I can both tell you that he has spent a lot of personal energy with senior leaders in the Department of Defense to make sure that they clearly understand his capabilities and what is required for him to deliver um, accomplishing his mission out here. And so we have done that internal to the department, waiting for the FY23 budget to hit. That hit a few weeks ago, and so now we're sharing that with everybody else. And so I, I, I am confident that everybody clearly understands what our, what our capability gaps are. I just told you, what I, what I read to you, all that list was the unclassified portion of the report we submitted to Congress. And I know we're continuing to, to amplify that to everybody that, that we talk to in industry. Just had a, uh, our J8 ran a conference here a few weeks ago, their annual post-conference, which does the same thing, clearly articulates not only in open sessions like this, but they also have a closed session for all the, the, uh, the industry partners that maintain security clearances to, to participate in so we could even go a, a level or two deeper in a classified piece. So I think we are doing that um, well. Hopefully we are, and we look forward to y'all solving some of our hardest problems for us. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> what technology, training, and or personnel gaps do Indo-PACOM mm -hmm. forces have regarding information operations? Yeah, I mean, Vic, did you ask this question? All right, all right. Uh, Vic and I worked at SOCOV here a few years ago together, and uh, a great I.O. Uh, expert over there. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we can always do better in, in a lot of these, and one of the the problems we have here is in the Indo-PACOM region is we haven't been at war like we have at CENTCOM for the last 20 years. And, and what I mean by that is in CENTCOM AOR, we've been at war for 20 years, and when you have a crisis that drives uh, everybody to work together to solve that problem. And so in the information, the, the Department of Defense doesn't own the information environment. One of the problems is that nobody in the U.S. government owns that problem, um, and that's a problem. However, we defer to the Department of State uh, when we operate in countries around the world. And so we, we have fratricide inside senior levels of the Department of Defense. We did something in Indo-PACOM. Uh, we were asked to do something here um, a month ago. And I'm speaking very nebulous because it's classified all the, the details, but just to prove a point, we were, we were told, hey, we need to do this uh, activity. And so we said, okay, and so we, we want an active public affairs posture. And they said, nope, can't talk about it. And so we did something, and the folks that we were trying to influence probably never knew it. And we're sitting here saying, you know, that's, that's horrible, horrible. And so we were fratricide inside the Department of Defense, and then it gets a little bit more challenging when we go across the, the town to the Department of State in Washington and try to get their concurrence to allow us to do stuff in the MISO and IO realm. And so we've, we've got to do a better job of communicating and coordinating, collaborating, get everybody on board. Um, and so that's, that's one area. Um, we are doing some good things in, in military deception, um, but I, obviously those, those are sensitive and so can't really talk about them. And then cyber, I'll, I will talk about cyber and space just to bring them in there that, you know, Admiral Aquilino has been has driven very forcefully to make sure that the staff, every time we do something, we're including cyber and space into all of our activities. And that just allows us to operate in all domains, not just coming from a single axis, but really trying to come from multiple axes to give our adversaries multiple dilemmas. Um, it, it makes it much more challenging for them to react. And so those are, those are some, I, I don't know that we, uh, I think training-wise, every big end exercise we're doing, we're incorporating all of it. Um, probably more is, the, is really just the authorities that we need to be a little bit more effective. And, but don't get me wrong, we internally to Indo-PACOM, we can do a better job ourselves. So I think it's everybody working together to be more effective in this space. You know, my, if you haven't read Like War, um, I'd recommend reading that book. Uh, it, uh, Peter Singer, he's got several of them. That was, I think, one of his first ones. He writes them with others. But, but I mean, we're going to just look at the information uh, competition that's going on right now in Russia and Ukraine. 
look at the information competition that's going on uh, in Indopaycom AOR. That the, in, the fight in the information environment is potentially where we're going to win or lose future battles, and so we got to get better at it. Thank you. Do you see value in a NATO-like organization for nations in the Indo-Pacific region? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, in personal opinion here, uh, I, I will be quick to add that. I, I don't know. Um, you know, the, I think our, a lot of our partners in the region are, are um, you know, don't necessarily have the, the capabilities and the capacity that our European, a lot of European nations have. They're proud uh, of their heritage. Uh, they value their land and their cultures. And so I don't know that we really need a NATO-like uh, effort out here. But it's really, I think, the, the, those that share our values and that share freedom and uh, a free and open Pacific where each country has the autonomy to, to choose their own future, I think is, is a valuable because I, you, know, you look at the way that countries that are our allies and partners think, you look at the other countries that you know, share some of the Chinese ideals like Russia, like North Korea, you know, what's your choice? And uh, what's that? Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, Admiral Mackey's probably much much more capable to answer that question than I am, but I, I uh, so I, I don't necessarily think that, that we need one um, because I think our ideals and our our way of life and those nations that share them I think will be strong enough. Thank you. Uh, this is the last question we've received. What agency is carrying the torch to address the lack of joint governance and various inhibiting policies? that transcend across AO boundaries and COCOMs? Hmm. The, uh, I'm trying to, so are you, uh, the lack of joint governance and various inhibiting policies, uh, is it a specific capability or are you just talking about in general? I don't, I'm, I'm struggling, I, I, and I'm, I know it's probably gonna take time to get some feedback uh, over email, but I, I guess, um, you know, I, I think I think we're doing okay. Um, you know, the joint governance is, is tough. Uh, it's our system. It's the Department of Defense's system. And the, the problem with it is that the, the joint forces don't have the resources. The services have the resources. And the services are going to do what the services are going to do. And it's very tough to influence them. I think Admiral Aquilino was masterful in his, this report that he just submitted to Congress, he uh, sent it to the service chiefs first and said, hey, I want your agreement and it, are there things in here that you want me to advocate for in my report to Congress? And so there was a dialogue there. Some of the services uh, used that little, that inch and tried to, to stretch it out for 100 yards or so and tried to throw some things in, in there. But Admiral Aquilino is very firm. If, if it's not delivering capabilities for the Indo-PACOM region, then I don't want to include it. But at least there was that dialogue. And so now, I mean, even as we received some pieces of the budget, part of the problem OSD was trying to struggle with was, okay, how do we give it to Indo-PACOM? Uh, and they didn't really want to give it to the joint headquarters. And there wasn't necessarily a way to do that, they said. But then they didn't want to give it to the services because the services, they couldn't control the services to make sure that and hold them accountable that they actually spent it on the stuff for Indo-PACOM. So uh, you, we, we got to figure out ways that we can empower joint headquarters to deliver joint effects. And right now we're empowering service headquarters to deliver service effects. And sometimes those don't necessarily align with, with joint requirements. But I, I think we're, Admiral Aquilino has done a great job of communicating those. He's got everybody on board, and I think we are helping uh, to move the, the, the football down the field. The Guam Defense System, um, while MDA, uh, the Missile Defense Agency, has the responsibility to build that, that uh, you know, it's, it is being driven by our requirements. 
And so that, that's a test case, and we'll see how well that works as we, as we work to solve these problems. But thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you, General, for your time and for your remarks. Uh, so I do want to, to recap a few things that I captured. If we can communicate, we can win. We have an asymmetric advantage in this theater. We share information with all of our partners. The challenges and priorities of U.S. Indo-PACOM Command operating in their contested space all domain battle space awareness, near-term capability to deliver effects, protect the joint force, train the joint force, and deliver integrated deterrence. And when you talked about data to dominance, the words I captured was obtain, move, protect, share, use. And if you do that, that is achieving the dominance. And the last one, which I thought, I have never heard anybody describe leadership as a weapon system. And I think it's a great visualization that can be used. And, and yes, it's true. So we would like to present you with an AFSIA coin that recognizes 36 years of TechNet in Hawaii. And we are also making a donation in your honor to the friends of the Windward Wounded Warriors. So thank you. Okay, team, what a great conference. This has been amazing. Um, so this particular version of, of TechNet Indo-Pacific was certainly not without some of its challenges, given that we moved it here in the spring and April. So the, our teams collectively have just done masterful things in making it look like it was really smoothly done. So thanks to, to both Interna FC International and Hawaii for all that you have done. Uh, we appreciate you working through the schedule changes, and there were a few that we had to go through, <laughs> and the pandemic that, that the pandemic forced upon us, and other bumps on, on the road that came along. So we, we, we really do thank you. We are so happy to partner with FCA Hawaii to put this important event on, and it's the largest of its kind in the Indo-Pacific. And this week, uh, we were really concerned about the level of participation because we're going to turn around and do this again in six months. But you had a large, large, huge attendance, 2,735. So thank you very much. <laughs> this Hawaii chapter has an amazing 200 strong volunteer force that turns out every year to help run this event. And it's a remarkable chapter. Uh, that does incredible things throughout the state of Hawaii, including giving many scholarships and teacher grants to deserving students and educators in the STEM fields. So if you are so inclined and want to support this great chapter out here, you can just go to www.afsiahawaii.org and get information on how you can continue to contribute to them. I also want to thank industry uh, for all your support. So for the companies who came here and exhibited, we absolutely cannot put on any of these events without you. And as our success is because of you. So I really do appreciate all the hard work, especially most of you coming from mainland here. It's not an easy trek uh, to get all your, your uh, equipment here. But this year we maximized out the space completely. So we really do appreciate your support. We've heard you, um, many of you have approached us about wanting larger spaces, and, um, and, and we are looking into what our alternatives are for that. And finally, I'd like to thank the great staff here at the Hilton Hawaiian Village. They always treat us so well, 
and have high level of execution, whether it's a meal here, it's our rooms, um, the receptions we had, the breakfasts we had, they were just awesome. And lastly, <clears throat> if you're not a member of AFCIA, uh, we have an AFCIA booth over there in the, uh, the Natalis Suite foyer. Um, being a part of this great organization, I joined when I was a second lieutenant, and uh, there's so many benefits to being a member here. It's the number one networking organization for our backgrounds and what we do, whether it's intelligence, IT, cyber. So um, please join us uh, if, if you haven't already done that. Now, I'm going to ask you to stay with me for a couple more hours. I promise to have you on the beach by four. So, <laughs> So though I'm giving the closing remarks, uh, we do have a little bit, so a couple more content uh, things this afternoon. So at 2 p.m., we had the panel session across the street in the South Pacific Ballroom. It's being led by our emerging, our young emerging leaders. And if you haven't sat through one of their panels, they are amazing. So please join us there. And we also have the continuing education course next door at 2 p.m. as well. So again, Mahalo for attending. We hope to see you again right here for the 37th TechNet Indo-Pacific, uh, November 1st through the 3rd. And if you're traveling in from the mainland or overseas, be sure to fly in early so you can enjoy Halloween here in Hawaii, which is a great event to do. So, so safe travels, and I look forward to seeing you in November. Aloha. Thank you, General Gerard, for an excellent presentation. And Susan Lawrence for your closing remarks. Just like to remind you to visit the STEM room as well. And uh, for the JROTC cadets, can you please move to the bottom of the stairs for a uh, photo opportunity?